precious, precious day. Beautiful day. I, I agree with you, Tim. Isn't it amazing? We lived up north, and I don't miss the snow one bit, especially when it snows on For every, every pastor hates because it snows on Saturday night, you know. And, but it's uh, so good to be here. Thank you, worship team. You know, the fifth Sunday, we, we, they, they do an acoustical set to give uh, the worship team, uh, a lot of the people on the worship team, kind of a day of rest. And I just enjoyed that, just enjoy getting into the presence of God. So wonderful, wonderful thing. Something I want to share with you before we jump into our, um, our, our message today. Well, we're doing something this year that we, we have never done before, and that is that we are laying out a series of messages, a series of sermons that will touch on the major ologies of theology, and we're calling it Thrive 2021. And, uh, you know, that a lot of people have committed themselves to the, they, they've given their lives to Jesus, they've given their lives, they love the church, they love God, but they just struggle with uh, knowing how to truly share their faith. And there's so many deep or difficult questions that we have, and God's answers are simple. They're not simplistic, but they are simple, and they are in the Word, so uh, we have so much at our fingertips, you know, the internet has uh, opened it up, made it possible for us to access the Bible at any time. However, a lot of people really just struggle with uh, what to do next. What, what, what should I be studying? What should I be, what do I need to know? So we're moving in that direction, and uh, beginning next Sunday, as a matter of fact, and the first thing we're going to be talking about is, is salvation, the doctrine of soteriology, and there's also a lot of other ologies out there, eschatology and pneumatology and anthropology, and, you know, we pe- preachers will just drop those words out there like everybody ought to catch it, and the fact is we, we a lot of times don't, and uh, sometimes we, we, we struggle with that, so uh, we're beginning next week and throughout 2021, we're going to cover some topics that will inform you that will inspire you, that will instruct you, uh, just some of the same training that you would get. And I just promise you this, that it's not a cerebral pursuit. Uh, I know every congregation has thinkers and feelers, and uh, I happen to be a feeler. Uh, that doesn't mean that I don't think. And uh, for instance, Kenneth, is, he's more of a thinker, but that doesn't mean he doesn't feel but it just simply means that that's the way that we receive information, the way we process it. And God has designed us certain ways to be able to do that. But there are a lot of unanswered questions. We want to be able to address some of those. So that's beginning next week, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Today I want to just uh, pursue the final uh, few moments that we have on this uh, subject, the face of God. You know, we came across Psalm 27. I've shared this every week. Delia said, here's a great, a great scripture. This was back in December. And it's Psalm 27, 8. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, will I seek. So the, the psalmist is in this conversation with the Lord, and, uh, and, and God speaks to him and gives him this invitation, you know, Seek my face, and he responds, yeah, that's exactly what I'll do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek your face, Lord. I'm going to set my heart to seek your face. So seeking the face of God is seeking the presence of God. The face of God is the presence of God. We, <clears throat> we seek the presence of God. And last week, we talked about just that, uh, that, that idea of pressing into the things of God uh, rather than just kind of some passive uh, position or posture on our part, what will happen will happen, but understanding that we really can know the will of God. We can ask and find, we can ask and he will answer, we can seek and find, and uh, we can knock and the door will be open to us, that's his promise. So this week I just want to uh, close out this, this final message with a few words with you today about removing removing obstacles that keep us in, out of the presence of God. 
and dealing with those obstacles, understanding that we're not under the law, but we're under grace. We're not under the Old Testament law, but we're under the New Testament law of love, Jesus. And so uh, from that standpoint, we deal with things a whole lot different than people did B.C., you know, we, we do because since Christ has come, he has given to us liberty uh, to serve him. Go, go to Isaiah, the 59th chapter, first verse. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. This is a prophet speaking to the people in the Old Testament. Nor his ear too dull to hear. But he says to them, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And I just note this, that God does not hide his face from us. He says here, your iniquities. Iniquity really is a word for rebellion. It's a word for independence. It's a word for sin. It's a word for transgression. All of those things in your life, he says, those things, he's speaking corporately to a nation, and he says, all of those things have hidden his face from you. And I would just suggest to you today that when we have that sense that we are not in the presence of God, that's not God's fault, that's our fault. You see, our responsibility is to be in his presence. He says, I'm knocking at the door. If anyone will open, you know, he's there. And especially understanding the grace of God. He is constantly there. The Apostle Paul, even in, the, I think it's Acts, the 16th chapter, standing in Athens, says to a bunch of heathens, idol worshipers, that if you will just call upon his name, he's not too far from you. He's here. So that's his, not his responsibility. That's my responsibility to be in his presence. So Exodus, the 20th chapter, this is one of the uh, places where, in the many places in the scripture, where, where God speaks to the people about the, their idolatry and their worship of idols and so forth. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. Just kind of underline that in your mind, the word slavery there. You must not have any other God but me. You must not take for yourself an idol of any image or any kind or any image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or on the sea. You must not bow down to them and worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for other gods. So the Jews in the Old Testament, or in ancient times, the Jews were the only people who did not worship gods. Isn't that interesting? They were the only ones who did not worship gods. Idolatry existed and has existed for thousands of years where people would actually bow down and serve gods. And sometimes we think that's a little bit silly and that's kind of uh, uh, stupid, but it's... But, but, but we have our own. Our, our gods are just a little bit more sophisticated than they were back then. I've been in countries, and some of you have too, like India, where there's something like 30,000. No, it's more than that. It's like 3 million gods that have, that have developed out of 30 original gods. It's just many, 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 many times older, over. And people actually do worship them. They bow to them. They serve them. And he says to the people of Israel, so this was, this was major for them. This was, this was major. This was going counter to what the, any culture that they were around, this was totally counter. If, you know, when we see this, we say, okay, that's a piece of cake. Surely we can do that. We're not going to build something and bow to it. In those days, it was, it was a temptation. It was a great temptation because people wanted to to bring a God into some kind of a tangible presence. They can put their trust in tangibility. Psalm the, uh, 135. The idols 
of the nations are silver and gold made by human hands. They have, no, they have mouths, but they cannot speak, eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear, nor is there breath in their mouths. This is, this is, this is the heart of the, the Jewish understanding of God. And that is that all of these other gods out here, they are just in totally incapable of speaking, hearing, or seeing anything. But it's interesting, he says here in verse 17, 18, those who make them will be like them. So will all who trust in them. So that's an interesting statement because we become what we worship. You know, if we worship the Lord, we become Christ-like. If we worship other stuff, we become like that. That becomes the ruling factor of our lives. And I would say that that's the number one thing that you and I deal with. By the way, when I talk about stuff like this, I'm not saying I've got it all together. I just, I'm, almost, I'm almost perfect. Just keep praying for me in about about a year, I'll be perfect. <laughs> uh, no, none of us are going to be perfect, but God is perfecting us. So we are not perfect now, but we are being perfected, verb. He is perfecting us, and what he is doing is showing us how to truly worship him and being before him. So the greatest problem that they had in the Old Testament was that constantly God was saying, do not erect an image and worship it. Don't put your trust in an earthly entity. But we have some things that we put our trust in. Let me touch on a few of them today. And I believe that God wants us to be sensitive to those things that capture our allegiance and that separate us from the face of God. And, and here's the great thing about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will show you when you're being drawn to another. And when you're devoting too much time, energy, attention to that which is lifeless, because there's nothing, as a believer, we, we understand what lifelessness is. The wages of sin is death. Don't read that. If you sin, you're going to hell. That's not what it said. The wages of sin is death, separation from God. That's what separation from God is. And so I, I remember one time meeting somebody that didn't believe that, that, that you, after you're a Christian, you never sin. And she told me, she said, since I came to the Lord, I have never sinned. And I wanted to say, but she was a lot older than I, and I didn't want to be disrespectful. I wanted to say, you just did sin because you lied because <laughs> you have sinned. All of us have sinned. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have sinned. Turn to the other one and say, I know because I saw you. So the Apostle Paul, he talks to the church about the journey that Israel made through the wilderness and how many of them were defeated and God was not pleased with them and they died because of their idolatry. And then, this is in, in, in 1 Corinthians 10, in verse 6 he says, these things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did or worship idols as some of them did. Now, we're moving up to the early apostolic age, the early church age now, and idolatry is still rampant. And so it's easy then for us to once again say, Okay, well, he was telling them, don't serve these idols that, the Roman, uh, that are in the Roman culture. But I believe that he's saying something more to us than that. Don't idolize things that will separate you from God, that will get in your way. So I just want to give you a, cup, a few of them today, just uh, three or four or five or six. And uh, he says, here, here he says, we should or worship idols as some of them 
do. And it's interesting when you read these passages, and I'll get to Galatians here in a second, but it, when he talks about idolatry, that word is a companion to the word slavery. So whatever we worship, we become a slave of. And let me tell you this, that there's nobody in this room, nobody watching online, visit, uh, joining us today in church, that wants to be in slavery. We, we don't, we don't want to be enslaved by anything. Because some of us have had habits in our lives, and we were slave to those habits, and we hated it. And he has set us free. I thank God for that. But here's some of the things that we can be enslaved by. Number one, our identity. Uh, my, my identity, my work, my skills, my looks. Boy, that's a big one, isn't it? Because sometimes people will not even, that holds them back from any kind of freedom just because they're afraid of the way that, they don't like the way that they look. And achievements, uh, how many followers I have on social media. So, you know, it's okay to excel in all of these things. I, I do believe that it's good for us all to work. We need to exhibit our skills and our gifts. God wants us to look good. Social media is fine. But it, it's okay to excel, but it's not only repelling or repulsing, when somebody bows to their ego, it's also a tough way to live because you're constantly having to measure up to an identity that you have established for yourself. So it's a self-imposed idolatry, actually. And we will do that. We, will, we, we are prone to do that. Here's another one. Money, consumerism. This is an easy one because we all have experienced this at some time or the other. It doesn't matter how much money you have. You know, I've been in some very poor nations, and I want you to know that uh, nobody has a corner on greed because greed can just jump on just about anybody, whether they have a whole lot or have, have nothing. You know, sometimes we think people that have a whole lot, that they're very greedy, not necessarily. And then we think that people who have nothing would never be greedy, just needy but they could be greedy too. And there's that sense of entitlement, what you have I ought to have too. And that thing obsesses them where they are wanting constantly looking for them. So it's not evil within itself, of course, because God has given us the power to prosper, but many people put their trust in money. They idealize money, and they idolize it. The idea of having many things, if I just had so much more. If I could just get that, I would be satisfied. If I could just have this, I would be satisfied. But you know that none of those things will ever satisfy us. We uh, are born with a God-sized hole in our hearts that only God can fill. And only in the presence of God. I, I've learned that. I, I remember thinking one time, boy, if I just had a brand new car, a brand spanking new car. Wow, wouldn't that be cool for once in my, for once in my life I drove a brand new car. You know, I, I can just have that. And I get the car and, you know, it's just, it's just not all of that. And a bag of, of, uh, of Doritos, it's just not all of that. It's, it's, it's lifeless. Pursuits are lifeless, you know. How many beds can you actually sleep in? How many houses can you actually live in? How many cars can you actually drive? One at a time, the rest of them just sit there in, the, in that big 12-car garage. Ken's got one of those back there. He doesn't tell you about it. I'm just, just only in his dreams. But anyway, it's a, we can only do so much. So it's never satisfying to us. Here's another one. Uh, the idol of entertainment. I, b I believe that personally that entertainment is good. I believe it's a gift from God. We need recreation. We need vacations. We need rest times. We need times to relax. I like a good movie. I watched one last night. I think it was a good movie. Anyway, I like the plot and everything. I every now and then like a, a movie where the bad guys get beat up. And I just happened to watch one of those. 
And uh, please don't judge me on that. But if there are certain things about the plot and everything that can uh, intrigue us and help us intellectually. I mean, we, it's, it's entertaining. That's okay. But you can reach a saturation point on entertainment where there's something clicks in your spirit that says, okay, I've had all this I need. You know what I'm talking about? So we have it from Netflix to vacations to video games to podcast, and then, but it keep open to the Holy Spirit and let him say, okay, that's enough, that's enough. See, because we, so, we, we become obsessed and we become engrossed in what's happening around us many times. I think that can be an idol, idolatry too. You know, my own opinion about things can be idolatry, where I just bow to that. I know I'm right and everybody else is wrong. Like the soldiers walking down, one of them's out of step. The sergeant says, get into step. He says, I'm in step. Everyone else is out of step. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this right. Our opinions can, and things about our culture, you know, it, 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 could be, it could be that what is happening in the different power centers of our nation right now, uh, that we put, become so focused, y'all, and so engrossed in those things, and so, uh, so obsessed with those things, that, that we forget about the kingdom of God. And, and he says to us, I am God. Worship me alone. Worship me alone. There's no political figure. There's no economic figure. There's nobody on, 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 on Wall Street. There's nobody on Pennsylvania Avenue that should ever be worshipped. We worship God, see, don't we? We worship God. And, you know, that's, that's one way to get into the face, get into the presence of God, is get back to your worship, worshiping him. Amen. That's good preaching, Pastor. Thank you. I appreciate that much. Here's another one. This is big. Sex. It's a huge obsession in our culture. Probably more so than money. Something that is a gift given to us by God becomes the God of our lives. There are people who are obsessed with it. And there's not probably nobody in this room that hasn't had a struggle in some area regarding sex. And I'm just telling you this, that if you let, if you don't steward your passions and you let them run astray and freely, that you can develop in your own mind an idol there where you unconsciously are thinking about stuff that you really don't need to be thinking about 24 hours a day. That becomes... If I could just do this, if I could do that, you know. And, and so, so that's what leads people astray. People begin to idolize. This is what breaks couples apart, marriages apart, when a partner begins to idolize the idea of being with someone else. And we've all been tempted to think along those lines. If we're married or not married, we've been tempted to think along those lines. But we need to listen to the Holy Spirit who will give to us direction and guidance on how to get free from that. You know, even in our society, to question the sexual ethic of our society brings a litany of accusations. Because people, listen, don't touch me. It's my body. I'll do whatever I want with it. Uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. Not for believers. The Bible says our body belongs to who? It belongs to the Lord. It really belongs to him. And you know what? My body doesn't just belong to me. It belongs to others as well. Because what I do with my body is going to affect my wife. It's going to affect other people. So when I'm selfish enough, see, to say, I can do whatever I want. Don't tell me what to do. My selfishness becomes an idol. Here's another one that we pursue so much of, and that is comfort. Just the pursuit of ease. If I can just do this, get this, get this, get this lined up, get all of my ducks in a row, it's going to be easy street. There's an endless list of products promising to simplify and add comfort to our lives. And you know what? Our lives are easier than any time in history. 
any time in history. And our nation, in our nation, we have, it's easy for us, isn't it? Oh, there's so much ease. And yet we can become frustrated because we feel like that our comfort level is being uh, threatened. And, you know, we get frustrated if something doesn't happen in 15 seconds' time like it's supposed to. How many of you got mad at your cell phone and just threw it across the room? Don't show your hands. Because it didn't work. The crazy thing, to, when I was a kid, I remember covering my face at nighttime with a blanket and pretending that I had a little TV under the blanket and that I could just watch anything. I would read Dick Tracy comics and think, wouldn't it be cool to have information right on my wrist? And I don't have one of those smart things on my wrist. This is just a regular, this is a dumb watch, okay? This isn't a smart watch. I don't have one of those. But, but, but I've noticed, all of us, that we, uh, and this is actually, uh, you know, we, well, let me go to the next one, okay? I'm just stumbling over myself here. Because this is, this is what, uh, you know, our, our cell phones, this is our final one. <laughs> our media, our phones. Where I can't sit silent for five minutes without pulling out my phone, which, by the way, I lost this morning. Between the living room and the bedroom, I lost it, honey. It's at home. And she got one of those Alexa thing. And so is it Alexa or Alexis? No, Lexus is the car, and Alexa is the, so for Christmas, she got that. I said, Alexa, call Paul's phone. <laughs> and I, Alexa don't know me. That's a problem. We're going to have to introduce Alexa to me because my phone was lost. But we can't sit five minutes, you know, w without refreshing our news feed. And, and this may not bother you, uh, but... And it may not at times bother me because I'm just a part of it. I see myself doing the same thing. Because I'm sitting somewhere outdoors, you know, in a public place, whatever, and I've got my phone, I think. And I look up, and everybody's on their phone. They're walking with their phone. They're talking with their phone. They're sitting with their phone. They're, they're and I think, look at all those people using that, their phone. And then I say, oh, I am too. I'm doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. Where we just can't go but a few minutes. And I, I, I feel like in my own life, I, I, I realize this more and more. Maybe I've realized it more this year than ever before. How I just simply need to have some time with the Lord. Where I just need to, I just, I find myself doing this, just sitting and pondering and doing nothing and meditating. And do you know, if we did more of that, if you could put aside, get up a little bit earlier and put aside five or ten minutes, don't even time yourself, just a moment. Sometimes we say, I don't know how to pray. That's okay. Sit still. God will speak to you. And God will give you things to pray about, just quietly before him. That's why I think church is so important, coming to church. It gives us an opportunity to kind of sit under the auspices of the word and reflect on things without being engaged in other stuff. And there's such a lack of that right now in our lives. And now is the time, as never before, that we need to exercise the opportunities that God gives us, uh, because it's, this is an obsession that is so dehumanizing and so degrading. And uh, think, think about what it does. You know, I heard one child say to me, uh, my, when we go to the supper table, my mother wants, always wants to have supper, and, and my dad comes in, and he just sits there with his phone all the way through supper. And, and that's sad, y'all. That is sad. Because what it is doing is destroying communication with other people. 
there are young people right now that do not know how to carry on just a, an ordinary conversation because their heads are in the electronics all the time. What is the future going to hold for us? And I'm not, I'm not dissing the young people. I'm talking about older folks too. All of us are elders as well. Is that we can be so obsessed with this that we can't go three minutes without checking up on whatever. Galatians, the fourth chapter. Is, was that okay just to lay those out there? There's a lot of others too, but I won't get to those. Galatians 4, verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves. Everybody say slaves. The idolatry and slavery work hand in hand, companions. You were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Then he goes on. That's in chapter 4. Chapter 5, he says, For you have been called to live in freedom. We're not in slavery. We've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. So he has given to us this freedom. Verse 16, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing that which your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is opposite of what the Spirit wants, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives us desires that are opposite what our sinful nature desires. So these two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law. And this translation here says the law of Moses. Many translations just simply say the law. And I believe that's actually the, the, the right translation. Because the idea is that we're no longer under the law of Moses. Say, well, okay, no, the commandments have nothing to do with me. But when he says the law, he's talking about any demands that are put upon us, moral demands that are put upon us by God. So the people will say, well, I'm doing my best to, do, to, to, to serve. I'm doing my best to fulfill the Ten Commandments. I'm, I'm doing my best to obey the Ten Commandments. Christianity is not obeying the Ten Commandments because there are many more than Ten Commandments. Those are great commandments. And I love about what I love about grace is not you shall not, but the grace of God says to us, you will not, you will not want to commit adultery, kill people, steal, lie, bear false witness, and so forth. So he says, so what he's saying here is he says, um, uh, where, where was I? The, uh, this is so good, too. Yeah. But you, when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law. In other words, there's another law now working in you, and it is the law of love. It is the law of Christ. And it is a superior law. And the reason why it is a superior law is because your spirit is now wedded with the Spirit of Christ. And you are one with him, and there's a force within you that is telling you what is right and what is wrong. I can read every commandment in the Bible, Old and New Testament, every suggestion, and, but there's still going to be something in my life that is not even mentioned there. So w what is the Christian life all about? The Christian life is not obeying the rule book. The Christian life is living the life of Christ. And that, that what, is, what I share with you today, what I want to share, is that that's where we get life, and that's where lifelessness comes. Otherwise, we is death. So when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, he names a few of them, the results are very clear. 
Here's our idols, sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling. Everybody say quarreling. Just say, I'm sorry, Lord. No, half of you repented. Jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have told you before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, I will always love it because there's always a but there, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these there's no such law. Nobody goes to prison for being too gentle. Verse 24, And those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions of and desires of their sinful nature to the cross. Since we are living by the Spirit, we've crucified them. Since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So if there is a, a how do you do this? So if there is something that you say, you think, you know what? That is an idol in my life. It's something that I am obsessed with. I'm thinking about it all the time. Whether it's me, somebody else, or something, whether it's a habit, whatever it is. I don't care what it is. But it's something that I know separates me from the freedom that I have in Christ. What do I do about it? The Bible tells us that if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. Let me give you a little secret. Y'all, this works. This works. How many of you know that with everything written in the Scripture, there's a practical application to it? This works. And that is this, that I have had things in my life that I knew were not right, and I would repent of those things. You know, it, it's easy. After you've stole, robbed, I never robbed a bank, but say a bank robber goes out there that's a Christian. That's not, a, that's not even a good analogy. But say, uh, say I do something that is wrong. And then after I have done it, it's got, kind of like, well, it's kind of like, you know, I've gorged. Uh, let's do that one. I've, I've been a glutton. I've gorged to where when I lay down at nighttime, I, I, can, I, I, I feel like, oh, I've eaten so much. How many of you know you can, after you have gorged, you can, you can commit to going on a fast right there because you're just all full, you know. And so it's the same way when I've done something that I shouldn't do and then I come and I, okay, I'm sorry, Lord. That wasn't all that it, I, I shouldn't have done that at all. And there's a certain relief there, and I get relief through my repentance. But here's what happens when I confess. Confession is this. Confession says to him, Lord, this is happening in my life, but I don't want it to. And I confess to you that I am weak in this area. And I confess to you that I need help. When you see confession is the admittance that you're dependent upon him. That's what confession is. So he says, if you will just confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. Has he already forgiven? Of course. 2,000 years ago, he forgave once and for all. But there is a manifest forgiveness that takes place. And the manifest forgiveness is that the favor of God is released on us. That's why he says, if you don't forgive your brother, then you're not, uh, the Father will not forgive you. That doesn't mean that he's going to be forever angry with you. It's just simply this, that if you don't forgive, then the favor of God will not be released on your life. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is the cancellation of debt against you, and it's the release of God's favor on our lives. So if we confess, he will forgive. And I am grateful. 
I am so grateful today for the truth of God's Word that sets us free from anything, any idol that we have built, anything that we have become a servant of, we can be set free from it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me read to you this final verse of this series, and it's the blessing from Numbers, the sixth chapter, verse 25. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Now, I'd like for you to do this right now. I want to read this again, and I want to pray this again. But I'd like for you to do this. Just close your eyes for a moment. Give your, yourself and those around you a moment of privacy. And sometimes we do that in prayer. We close our eyes. But I want to pray this prayer, this prayer blessing. Lord, I thank you right now for blessing everyone who is here and keeping them. Lord, I thank you for making your face shine upon everyone within the sound of my voice. I thank you this morning, Lord, for being gracious, for releasing your favor upon each and every one. And Lord, I thank you for turning your face today toward us, to all of us, and giving us peace, shalom, wholeness, completeness, healing, fulfillment in every part of our lives. I thank you for that, and I give you the praise. Amen. Would you stand with me? There may be those today who are joining us online or here who have never made um, confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and received him as your Lord. And we want to give you that opportunity to do that today and pray this prayer. And I'm just going to ask everyone to pray with me. And um, uh, as, a, as a, you know, it's just great. It's just, as, a, as, a, as a whole, we do that. And... Um, What's advantageous about that and what's so positive about that is that it encourages others to pray that prayer as well. So would you just pray with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, everyone real loud. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for coming out of the grave that I might live. And thank you for being in heaven and interceding for me so that I might be full, I might be filled, that I might be holy, that I might be your child. And I give you this praise. I just invite you into my life. And from this day forward, I am your disciple. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.